Okay, and the last speaker in our morning session is Andrea Chianke. Please, Andrea. Thanks, Daria, for the introduction, and <clears throat> thanks to the organizers for their invitation to this uh, conference, of which I'm very honored. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, about some joint work with uh, Vladimir Mazia and also with uh, Anna Balci, Lars Dining, and uh, Vladimir Mazia as well. And uh, it's basically containing these papers that appear here on the screen. Now, uh, let me start by just recalling uh, what's going on with the classical Poisson equation, so a linear equation. Uh, minus Laplace equal to f in omega, and omega is as usual an open set in Rn and larger than two or equal than two. Now, the right hand side here is assumed to be an L2 function, and uh, it's well known that, uh, I mean, a priori uh, a solution is just a uh, weak solution is just W1 to log. But uh, thanks to being a solution to this equation, it enjoys stronger regularity properties, which are just local if we are uh, confined with local solutions. But if we have uh, boundary value problems like directly homogeneous uh, data, then if the boundary is also regular enough, then uh, the solution enjoys also global regularity uh, properties. Now, I'll be dealing with second order regularity of solutions. And in the linear case, it's well known that uh, if f is in L2, then solutions are, in fact, twice weakly differentiable. And the second order derivatives are in L2 as well. So solutions are in W22 log of omega. Uh, if the boundary is uh, sufficiently smooth, for instance, classically C2 boundary, then the solutions to the Dirichlet problem with zero boundary condition are in fact globally in W22 omega. And uh, the second derivatives of the solutions in L2 can be bounded from above and from below by the uh, same norm of the right hand side. This is a quite classical result that goes back at least to Bernstein in dimension two and to Schauder in dimension larger than the or equal to three. Of course, the lower bound is trivial because f is just uh, um, the, the, the Laplace of u, so it just contains uh, some of the derivatives of u. The interesting point is the upper estimate for these derivatives. Now, uh, conditions uh, on the boundary which are weaker than just uh, being C2 were proved by Masia in his early papers where he proved uh, sharp conditions for the regularity of the boundary for this kind of estimates to, to hold. And uh, all these proofs basically rely upon an identity, a, dif a differential identity, which tells us that uh, modus of efficient squared is equal to the second derivative of u squared plus a term in divergence form, which uh, in the case of uh, this Laplace operator takes this form. And this expression here is crucial for uh, the development of these results. Now let's go to nonlinear equations, which is the topic of my talk. And uh, in principle, we can deal with uh, local or global solutions to nonlinear elliptic equations of this form, where you have a divergence of uh, an operator, which is a gradient times a coefficient, which depends on the modus of a gradient. And we have the right hand side f. Now this coefficient uh, satisfies certain growth conditions of this form. I will not, uh, uh, which essentially tell that uh, it's far away from the one Laplacian, this is a lower estimate and as uh, a growth, which is not faster than polynomial. This is the upper, estimate in a sense. But uh, I will, uh, uh, for simplicity, just focus on the case where a of t is uh, this power t to the p minus two with p minus uh, larger than one, which means that uh, I'll be considering the p Laplace equation, uh, which has been discussed um, at the beginning of this talk by Rosario uh, 
few minutes ago. Now, this regularity theory for, for nonlinear elliptic equations, so in particular in divergence form and of pillar fashion times has a long uh, history, uh, at least uh, since the, the 60s of the last century, and in particular, as recalled by Rosario, the Russian school, uh, with the work of the Dizinskaya and Ratseva, had an impact uh, in the beginning of this uh, uh, theory. Uh, still, uh, I mean, uh, in spite of several results, uh, not much is known about uh, second order regularity properties of solutions to, to this uh, very basic equation. And uh, let me say that, uh, I mean, by now classical result, which is in fact, uh, I mean, the, the, the beginning of the proof of the C1 alpha regularity of solutions to this kind of equation, in fact, tells us that uh, I mean, this expression here, this nonlinear expression of the, of the gradient, which is the gradient times this power P minus two over two of the modulus of the gradient is in fact the solar function. And uh, with uh, the, the, the right hand side, which is either zero, so P harmonic um, functions or uh, satisfy some uh, good regularity properties. Um, however, in more recent years, it, it, it uh, emerged that um, certain regularity properties of solutions to, to P, P location type equations are better uh, expressed in terms of uh, this different uh, nonlinear expression of the gradient instead of that one. And this is, in a sense, uh, natural because this is nothing but the expression which appears under divergence in the formulation of the equation itself. Now, this is clear for uh, some papers that I'm uh, recalling here. Uh, for instance, this one by Dinin Kaplitschke and Schwarzacher, who prove um, BMO and elder regularity properties in terms of this expression. Then there are uh, local point-wise estimates in terms of potentials, which were proved by Cusi and uh, Mingione. Uh, we have some global counterparts of these results uh, with the uh, Masia in terms of rearrangements. And we have uh, some precise local oscillation estimates uh, in the setting of Campanato type spaces uh, in papers with Dominic Bright, Lars Dining, uh, Sebastian Schwarzacker, and one also with Tom Cusi, uh, both in local and global form. Uh, there are fractional regularity results uh, for this nonlinear expression in a paper by Aben and Cusi and Mingione and Barcidini and Weimar. And uh, so it turns out that also the second order uh, regularity theory in L2 can be uh, well formulated in terms of this uh, nonlinear expression. And uh, I mean, the philosophy of the results I'm going to, to present is uh, the following, is that if you have this P Laplacian equation with the right-hand side F, then uh, this expression under divergence, so modus of gradient to the P minus two times gradient is a subordinate function, is W12, if and only if the right-hand side is in L2. So this means that basically uh, this expression inherits exactly the same degree of integrability of the function F in L2. And of course, in the linear case, uh, this matches uh, the, the classical result I told you about at the beginning, that uh, f is in L2, even only if a gradient now is just W12, which means that the solution U itself is W22 function. Now, let me be more precise, and uh, let me start by uh, what uh, we can say about the local regularity theory for this uh, problem. And uh, this goes back to this paper of mine with the uh, Masia, which tells you that uh, if P is any exponent larger than one and the right hand side is at two, and we have a local solution to this P Laplacian type equation, then uh, as I said, this expression under divergence is in fact a subordinate function, at least locally. And we have uh, a local bound in terms of bolts and double bolts on the right hand side. And here, of course, the critical uh, term is this one, where we are estimated the gradient of this expression of the gradient in L2. Then we have also this lower the term. And on the right hand side, we have the, the L2 norm of F and uh, this weak norm of the gradient in Lp minus one. 
So this is a local result which holds four equations. Now, uh, the key, a key point is uh, in this proof is uh, a differential inequality, which serves as a replacement for this identity, which is true in the linear case. So this identity concerns just Laplacian of U, and this is uh, the starting point in the proofs of this classical result I mentioned before. Now, for the P Laplacian operator, which means P larger than one, we have uh, a version of this where instead of equality, we have an inequality. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have uh, the operator, which is divergence of this nonlinear expression squared. And on the right-hand side, we have two terms. One is uh, this one. This is basically, I mean, after taking modules, this is basically the gradient of the nonlinear expression under the divergence. So it's a gradient of number u to the p minus two times number u. And then we have a, this extra term, which is in divergence form. So it's crucial here, of course, that uh, C is positive. So if we drop the divergence here, we have exactly what we want because this divergence squared is nothing F squared. So this means is that we are bounding uh, the second derivative of u in a squared by f squared point wise. We have this additional term, which is uh, uh, what makes possible uh, the estimates that we are looking for. Now, what about systems? Now, with Berlin Mazia, we had uh, a parallel result for systems, which means that uh, now we are taking vector value functions into R capital N for this P Laplacian. And we had it for not all values of P larger than one, but just for P larger than three halves. This restriction on P is due to the validity of a version of this pointwise differential inequality for vector value function. And it turns out that in this more recent paper with Anna Balch and Lars Dini as well, uh, we were able to enlarge the range of values of a parameter P for which this differential inequality holds. And uh, this proof relies, as you can imagine, on algebraic uh, arguments. And uh, this uh, inequality takes the following form. So take any P larger than or equal to one. At this stage, P equal to one is also allowed because it's just a differential inequality. And uh, N is the domain variable is an integer and the capital N is larger than or equal to two. So we are here in the setting of systems. And this is inequality that we have. So the structure is as before, the divergence of this expression, which is just the operator, which eventually will be F squared. On the right-hand side, we have a divergence of some expression. So all this expression is under divergence. And then we have uh, this term, which is uh, basically, uh, which are basically second derivatives of u squared, uh, not of u, but of this expression here squared, times some constant, which depends on p. And we have an explicit expression for this constant, which is also sharp. So this depends on p and takes a different form depending on whether p is larger than or equal to two between uh, four thirds and two and between one and four thirds. This function here is uh, however continuous, but the point is that uh, in order for this inequality to be of use in our estimate, we need that uh, uh, it's positive of course. And this is true if and only if P is larger than this number here, which is approximately 1.17. Uh, so we are close to one, but not, uh, not uh, yeah. And one cannot reach one. Good. So uh, using this pointwise, sharp pointwise inequality, we are able to extend uh, this second order regularity for solutions to systems up to this uh, uh, threshold uh, here, two times two minus square root of two. And the result is as before, the right hand side is L2. We have a local solution to the Pilaplacian system then this expression is a solar function locally 
and we have a point-wise estimate for, uh, uh, let's say, the second derivatives, uh, I mean, the, the derivatives of this uh, nonlinear expression of the gradient in terms of the norm of f in L2 and this weak norm of the gradient. Now, uh, the point is that this lower bound is uh, optimal, cannot be improved uh, for the approach that we have to this question because uh, the, the inequality itself breaks down uh, since uh, the, the constant is sharp. Uh, the question is if the result, if the second do the regularity holds or not for uh, systems is still open. Uh, uh, at this point for every p strictly larger than one. So it's true in the scalar case for systems, it's not clear. Uh, clearly, this would require a different approach. Now, let me uh, say something about the global theory, which was the original motivation of uh, our um, investigation with Vladimir Mazia. We were interested in uh, um, minimal regularity assumptions on the boundary. So now let's say that we have a Dirichlet problem with zero boundary conditions. And uh, as I said, we were looking for minimal regularity on the boundary for a second order regularity to hold. Now, uh, the result I'm going to tell you about are contained in uh, this paper with Masia for equations and uh, with uh, Anna Balch and uh, lasting also for systems. Uh, so even if uh, we were looking for minimal regularity on the boundary, let me uh, start, and maybe this will be all what we'll be able to tell you, with the basic version where the domain is a convex set. Now in the convex set, uh, we have uh, either a scalar problem and any p larger than one, or a vectorial problem and p larger than this threshold. And if we have any bounded convex set in Rn, so no extra regularity on the domain is required beyond uh, convexity, then if the right hand side is in L2 and U is a solution to our Dirichlet problem, then this expression is globally a sovereign function in W12, and we have a double sided estimate for uh, the sovereign norm of this expression in terms of the. Uh, datum f in L2. So again, the lower bound is trivial, What the point is uh, the upper bound. And uh, since we have this two-sided estimate, this shows that uh, this is uh, sharp. I mean, this is uh, the, the best possible result one can hope for with the right-hand side just in L2. Let me just mention that uh, there are some previous results in this period dealing with this nonlinear expression and derivatives of this. Uh, however, these were uh, mainly concerned with either uh, zero right hand side, so p harmonic functions, or uh, equations where the right hand side has stronger regularity properties than just being square integrable. And most of these results were dealing with local solutions. Uh, or, uh, I mean, uh, deeply problem, but in uh, much smoother domains. So here I'm mean, quoting a few of these uh, related results uh, were available before our contributions. And after our papers uh, um, recently appeared other um, uh, results uh, where there are some extensions uh, basically dealing with uh, a more general differential operators which are still in form of preprint, as far as I know, and these are due to Guarnotta and Mosconi and Antonini, Ciraulo and Farina. Of course, a main open problem is whether uh, a similar result hold for right hand side in LQ. So is it true that if F is in LQ, then this nonlinear expression is W1Q? These kind of results are, of course, uh, true uh, in the linear case, these were known, and this is true for every Q between one and infinity, excluding uh, endpoints. But here, uh, nothing seems to be known. It turns out that uh, uh, there must be some restriction on the values of P and Q due to the sharpness of uh, some C1 alpha estimates uh, in dimension two, which are known. And because if this result were true for any P and Q, then this would imply better uh, 
um, alpha regularity of the C alpha regularity of the gradient, then it's possible. So some restriction is uh, certainly needed in the nonlinear case. Now, let me move to uh, the question of uh, um, weakening the regularity on the uh, domain. So dropping convexity and looking for um, kind of uh, uh, regularity of the boundary. So the point is that uh, uh, the reason why uh, for convex sets, we don't need any extra uh, regularity assumption is that uh, um, when we integrate this pointwise inequality that I've shown to you, the divergence goes to an integral to the boundary. And that integral on the boundary in case of convex sets uh, involves uh, curvatures which have a sign. And the sign is the right one to get rid of the term in the estimates. So for convex set, I mean, the, the boundary term in a sense helps the estimates and this can be just neglected. This is not the case uh, when you have more general domains where the, the second uh, fundamental form doesn't have uh, a sign. And in that case, uh, we have to assume some integrability assumptions on the weak curvatures on the boundary. Now, uh, the assumptions that we impose are the following. So we start with the domain, which is at least a Lipschitz domain, which means that it's locally the subgraph of the function, Lipschitz functions of M minus one variables, as you well know. And we, in addition, ask that uh, this function is at least twice weakly differentiable. Now, uh, what about uh, uh, properties of this uh, second derivatives of the boundary? So these are required to belong to some uh, Lebesgue space or better weak Lebesgue space. And the proper assumption, at least when dimension n is larger than or equal than three, is that they belong to the weak L n minus one uh, Lebesgue space, which I will denote by L n minus one infinity. So this is a weak space or matching Kievich space. This goes under different names. In the two dimensional case, this is a borderline situation. And here we need a variant which entails a weak L log L space, which I denote this way. So these properties are I mean, denoted this way that the boundary belongs to W2 in this matching cabbage on this W2 L log L weak space. So as the consensus of this assumption, you know, that the second fundamental form of the, the boundary also belongs to, to these weak spaces. And these the weak spaces can be defined in terms of decreasing rearrangements of the, this uh, fundamental form of this norm, which I denote by B sharp, or more precisely by B double sharp, which is this expression and is basically a maximal function associated with this. So in most cases using uh, B sharp or B double sharp doesn't make a difference. It only arises when dealing with this L log L weak spaces. Now these arrangements are uh, depicted here. So you start with an n-dimensional function and the decreasing rearrangement, as you may be known, is a one variable function, which is non-increasing on the half real axis and has the property that each level set of the regional function has the same, in this case, one dimensional level measure of this decreasing rearrangement, which means just the length of this interval. Some properties are preserved under this operation like integrability properties. And with the help of this uh, decreasing rearrangement, one can define this weak norm as a soup of this expression and this uh, weak log L uh, uh, norm as the soup of this other expression. Of course, one can use the distribution function instead of rearrangements uh, for these definitions. Now, this is not the end of the story. So our assumption, the boundary requires that not just uh, that the curvatures are in this space, but requires some smallness assumption on small balls centered at the boundary. So we need that if we take these norms on small balls on the boundary, then they are sufficiently small if R is sufficiently small. This means that there is a constant which depends on the, on the uh, diameter Lipschitz constant of the domain such that 
that uh, if for mold ready it is less than this constant or in the two-dimensional case that this weak L log L norm is less than this dimensional constant here. And it turns out that these conditions are not just technical, but apart from the value of the constant, these are in fact optimal. So uh, these are satisfied if uh, the boundary is C2, as you can imagine, or even if the boundary is W2 and minus one. So if the curvatures belong to the strong L and minus one space. So this is like a weakening, uh, final weakening of membership in the L and minus one space. And similarly, in the two dimensional case, uh, membership in W2, Q with Q larger than one suffices. However, let me mention that uh, there are sets omega for which these are true, but for which the boundary is not even C1. So the statement of this result is the following. So again, we have to distinguish between the case when uh, we have scalar uh, functions, so equations and P is any power larger than one, or we have systems and P is larger than this threshold. The right-hand side is still in L2, and we have a solution for domains satisfying this minimal regarding the assumptions then uh, this expression is a uh, solar function globally and we have the same double-sided estimate for some constant c now as i said these assumptions on the curvatures of uh, the the domain cannot be weakened at least in an essential way and uh, there are examples in this connection so for instance consider uh, this uh, scalar uh, Dirichlet problem, so P Laplacian equal to F and U equal to zero on the boundary. Now one can find examples which go back to Masia in the 1670s, for which, for instance, P is between three halves and two, and is larger than or equal to three. The boundary belongs to this uh, weak space. So the second order derivatives are in the weak space but the norm is not small enough. So just the smallness assumption is not satisfied. And then uh, this expression is not a solar function. Uh, so just the smallest condition is, is uh, violated. And for um, two dimensional case, even in the linear case, there are counterexamples. So we have a boundary for which uh, the curvatures are in this weak L log L space. But again, the norm is not small enough. And the solution is not W22. So the, the classical uh, second order integrability fails because of lack of regularity of the boundary. So let me finish by just telling you uh, what is the outline of the approach. So um, different from other. Uh, proofs, the, the, the proof is global. So we are not uh, uh, basically flattening the boundary or localizing, there is a kind of localization, but uh, uh, no decay estimate in local form or something like that. Uh, so we just start by squaring this differential inequality I've shown to you. And, um, and then uh, what we have is that uh, we have just uh, um, on the left hand side, we have the LF um, that what we want to estimate. So the gradient of the nonlinear expression of the gradient. On the right hand side, we have uh, the norm of F in L2. And then we have this additional term, which is a divergence. Now, the point is to, to estimate this uh, term, which comes from the divergence, which, thanks to the divergence theorems, goes to the boundary, as I said. And then we have to estimate some boundary integrals. Now, if the domain is uh, convex, as I said, then these uh, boundary integrals have a sign, which is the right, and, uh, right one. So we can just forget about them. But if not, uh, these integrals uh, depend on the curvatures of the, of the boundary. And at some point, we, uh, we have to face inequalities of this form, which uh, are a kind of trace inequalities. So this is an integral over the boundary intersected some small ball for uh, some function f uh, v squared times a weight 
which is just, uh, I mean, uh, the, the modus of the curvatures of the boundary, which has to be estimated by the norm of the gradient of V squared inside the domain times some constant and uh, a quantity which depends on R, the radius of the ball. And it is for balls, uh, for functions which vanish on the boundary of this uh, ball here. And uh, now the point is the validity of this kind of trace inequality. And this is known to know hold uh, with this uh, quantity Q depends on R, which depends on this kind of uh, ratio, which involves integrals of uh, this weight, which is now the modulus of the curvature over a subset E on the boundary over the capacity of this uh, set E. And this is where this condition come from. So here I recall definition of capacity, which is quite standard. And uh, in order to move from capacities to, to in integrability properties of the boundary, one has to use this kind of uh, isocapacitary inequality between the capacities of set and the n minus one dimensional measure of subsets of uh, the boundary. Now, uh, this result made some improvements or extensions. For instance, uh, this uh, condition on the regularity of the boundary can still be improved in a sense uh, on replacing. Uh, uh, Andrea, your time is over. Okay, so I stop here. I didn't have uh, time to. And I just thank you for, for your attention. Okay. Questions, comments, remarks? Yes. Can you return the slide with a uh, constant K of P? Uh, say it again. Uh, uh, slide with a K of P, constant K, which you use. Uh, K. Uh, uh, from your uh, k of p equals, and there are three uh, different uh, formulas. Uh, uh, kappa, kappa, uh -huh. okay. kappa of p. Uh, that, this is a pointwise inequality, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. This one. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so kappa of p is negative for p equals one or close to it. Yes. Uh, so this gets negative if p is close to one. Yes. Mm. Thank you. So this is for for vectorial n. For a scalar, it's always positive, but for p close to one, it gets negative, and this is exactly the value. Which for which uh, this so for p close to one you have one has to use this expression, and it is exactly the the root of this polynomial uh, close to one. And for this one can uh, one has just take uh, um, polynomial of degree two, which show that it fails for uh, values of p less than this value. Mm -hmm. More questions. Uh, Andrea, uh, yes. am, I, am I right that uh, the exponent two uh, is uh, somewhat uh, exceptional? So uh, you cannot vary the summability of uh, this uh, term uh, uh, under divergence. So in that case, you have in fact uh, an e equality here for p equal to equal to two. So it's just a equality. This term here disappears. So we have no, just... no, no. I, I mean not p, but uh, the summability of this term uh, is only uh, double summability, uh, not less, not more. Yes, yes. This is the, the question that arises. So uh, well, this technique only works for, for p mm -hmm. equal to 2 because this okay. is basically squaring the, the operator and mm -hmm. uh, manipulating uh, the, the terms that you get and uh, having estimates. Mm -hmm. uh, so this doesn't seem to be flexible enough to extend the result for different values of integrability than, than two. So, uh, this, 
In a sense, uh, this is a generalization of the uh, second uh, Ladizhinsky inequality for the linear operators. Yeah. Probably I'm not familiar with that, but uh, yeah, it seems that uh, it should be. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. No, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, no more questions? Then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.